What's everybody, how are you? Uh, I'm back with another video lecture, this time for our content for Tuesday's class this week. Um, but before that, I just wanted to walk you through some reminders about how we're gonna be conducting class for the remainder of the semester um, and uh, kind of how expectations and timelines are shifting based on you know, the fact that we can't leave our homes except to do grocery shopping and buy gas. Um, so I hope you're all doing okay, and uh, it is, we do seem to be going back in time because it's also snowing outside, so um, our discussion of temporality in the, in the coming week might be actually kind of valuable. Um, so really quickly, uh, just a few reminders for you. Um, first of all, um, I mentioned this before, but we really are just going to be submitting work as it's completed. So I know some of you are working on reading and mapping projects, um, and those are ongoing. I think we only have two or three more that are going to be turned in over the course of the next few weeks. Um, please just get these to me when you can. If you're having trouble getting in touch with anybody in your group, let me know. Um, you know, the more communication about what's going on, the better. So reach out to me on the Slack uh, channel or also email is fine as well. I think I also sent you all my cell so you could text me there. Um, I'm very available to you because I can't leave my house. <laughs> so let me know how things are going. Um, and as I mentioned, really just following along with the reading and viewing materials and then doing your scheduled discussion entries. Those are going to be our top priorities in terms of on-time work. Um, so if you can do your best to follow along with the syllabus uh, structure, that means that you'll be able to stay up to date with the content I'm pushing to you and um, uh, participate in those Blackboard conversations, which is really where the bulk of our kind of um, collaborative work is taking place. So please do make an effort to stay up on those um, and everything else will be kind of finished as you can. Um, also, I am trying to stay caught up in Blackboard, so if you're behind a little bit and uh, you end up seeing a zero on, on a, something that you haven't submitted yet, please don't worry. Um, Blackboard just requires me to submit a number, um, and so that zero, just take that as work to be added, um, not as a final score. Don't freak out. Um, if you see one of these pop up, just email me that you'd like to turn the material in um, or that you have it completed once you do, and I will go back into Blackboard and overwrite that score. <clears throat> so don't worry about that. It's just me trying to stay up to date with my own schedule. Um, also, we had a supplemental reading to go along with um, Finding Nemo for Thursday, and I am not going to ask you to look at that. I'm going to ask you to just do the film and also the podcast. Um, I'm aware that some of you are having to put in extra hours with taking care of people in your family or working extra hours, so um, we won't be doing um, anything but the core readings in the class going forward, so I will post everything that I expect you to look at, um, just to kind of take down the time that you need to be spending looking at that stuff. So for Thursday, you know, your homework is to watch Finding Nemo, which I hope is not that challenging. I've loaded that into Blackboard for you if you don't have access elsewhere. Um, hopefully that will be fun uh, homework for you. And lastly, again, I know a lot of you are just working your butts off trying to get caught up, um, but if you do have questions or issues coming up, please just reach out to me. Um, you can get a hold of me a number of different ways. And my role here is to just get you over the finish line of this class and hopefully have a little bit of fun while we're doing it. Okay, so that's all the reminders I have so far for you. Let's get into the content. So <laughs> I love this still. Um, we are continuing uh, this week with our examination of the antisocial thesis. Now, last week we looked at Heather Love's The Politics of Refusal, and we paired that with a cinematic text, um, Greg Araki's The Living End, to think about um, counter-identification and its role, particularly during the AIDS crisis um, in queer politics and uh, this new style of queer um, sort of political consciousness that was developing in opposition to the discourses of gay identity politics that had kind of been growing throughout the 1970s. Um, and so, you know, this moment in the early 90s is the moment that gives us queer theory as well as this new meaning of queer. 
we looked at Queers Read This as a place where that meaning was getting articulated as a way of kind of saying, not gay as in happy, but queer as in fuck you, right? Um, so we're continuing this week to think about some of the further implications and kind of more current implications of antisociality. Um, and we're doing this uh, pairing a, a reading with a film again. So we're looking at Jack Halberstam's The Queer Art of Failure. And then a film that he spends quite a bit of time with in that book is Finding Nemo, which I'm sure many of you have already seen. Um, so let's get into it. First of all, who is Jack Halberstam? Uh, he is professor of English and Comp Lit at Columbia University. Um, and you'll notice we're reading two pieces from him over the next two weeks, and he has published under both Judith and Jack. So these are the same person, just uh, separated by <clears throat> a couple of years. Um, and this piece we've looked at is actually the title chapter from his 2011 book that was titled The Queer Art of Failure. Um, so we're kind of reading the area of the work where he lays out some of his biggest ideas. And um, if we look at the book as a whole, really what he's doing here is taking on the concept of failure as a resistant art cultivated by queer politics and culture. So um, if we think about how queer was a kind of um, reverse discourse um, strategy, right? Taking this word that was negative and claiming its power. We, we've talked about this uh, idea of reverse discourse earlier in the uh, semester when we looked at Stryker and her uh, claiming of monstrosity. Here we see Halberstam doing a very similar thing. He's taking this concept of failure and he's taking all of the kind of dominant meanings attached to that concept and he's reversing them against the dominant culture and saying actually to fail maybe is not such a bad thing. Um, maybe there are these like this, maybe there is hidden value um, in failure and maybe queer and trans people know a thing or two about that. So his central argument in this piece is that failing can be more transformative than winning. Um, remember, he's not saying that failing is like a secret kind of winning um, and that he's not just flipping the binary upside down. He's saying really that there are these like transformative energies inside failure that the dominant definition of failure doesn't allow us to access. Um, and he also says that failure leads to hidden revolutionary possibilities. So he's he's into the idea of failure kind of containing these possibilities that are often overlooked by the logic of success and that if we only follow the logic of success we'll never realize some of the more transformative aspects of failing like where failing can lead us the questions it can cause us to ask the relationships it can cause us to form um, the types of growth it can encourage us to un uh, undertake uh, he's really interested in those things outside of a capitalist framework now, um, Halberstam is really interested. He's got a kind of interesting archive here. We looked at Munoz, and Munoz was looking at all of these kind of instances of queer of color performance or watching certain kinds of performances. Um, Halberstam here is very interested in children's literature and particularly children's animated film as a space where things like immaturity, failure, forgetting, impulsivity, um, things that we would normally think you have to grow up and leave behind as, you know, styles of life that need to be replaced with more responsible um, ways of acting um, are celebrated and linked to these kinds of resistance, these collectivities that he is interested in saying, hey, there's like a, gr a huge amount of potential in these more childish behaviors that we're taught to leave behind. Now, remember, Greg Araki titles The Living End an irresponsible movie. So how are Halberstam and Araki both interested in how certain kinds of what we might say immature behavior are deemed irresponsible because they lead to what we would call failure within a capitalist kind of understanding? Um, so what Halberstam is doing here is... The whole book is really a response to another book written by Lee Edelman called No Future, in which Edelman, who's also a psychoanalytic antisocial uh, theorist, he argues that the, the image of the child, this idea of the child, is inevitably linked to straightness and to imagining the future. So he kind of says, you know, the only way we're able to imagine the future is through this idea of straightness and reproduction, and so we need to he says, fuck the future. 
basically like forget about the future the future is always going to be this space in which queerness cannot be imagined um, and we need to look backward right so he and love would actually kind of maybe be in dialogue there um, and Halberstam is like actually arguing with Edelman here saying actually if you look at children's culture and the way children actually act um, there's a lot of stuff there that looks pretty queer, right? Willful failure, uh, anarchic wild, new forms of relationality and sociality, right? That children themselves <laughs> actually seem pretty queer. And to kind of write off the figure of the child as this only meaning uh, this reproduction of straightness into the future is short-sighted. So why focus on failure? Um, Halberstam is saying that like because of how dominant society is set up that queer and trans people will kind of always be understood as failures automatically because of how our culture links success to reproduction and normativity um, and that we're just not set up to be able to compete under those conditions and so we will always lose. Um, so it's interesting to examine that. Um, he says that queers fail dominant notions of success as well as maturity, health, ethics, family, and common sense, because we make decisions that other people do not make and think of as dangerous, risky, immature, unhealthy, sinful, etc. cetera. Uh, Halberstam says rather than resisting failure, right, um, rather than kind of chasing the American dream and seeking to be considered normal, uh, happy, gay, gay and lesbian people, right, um, he says, <clears throat> we need to <clears throat> embrace our role as failed and investigate what it might have to offer. Um, and so again, he's interested in kind of looking at that failure as a source of power. Um, and he is indeed kind of working with love. Uh, he cites love, and I'll show that to you in a second. Love's concerns about the political utility of backwardness. Um, interpreting queer failure as what he calls a politics of anti-colonial struggle, a refusal of legibility, and an art of unbecoming. So I think while love is interested in kind of refusing the conditions under which identity is offered to, you know, LGBT subjects, Halberstam is more interested in how to unbecome things, right? Like how to uh, refuse the conditions and then become something else. Uh, kind of under the noses of people who think you're a failure. So like Munoz and Cruising Utopia, which was a book we're going to finish the course with, which had come out the year before, um, uh, which is uh, Munoz's last work before he passed away, Halberstam believes that queers must refuse normative definitions of success and also resist pragmatism or sort of like uh, pragmatism is just kind of using common sense and doing what will work in any given moment. Um, insisting instead on utopian forms. So insisting on something better or something different that we could get if we reject the conditions of the here and now, the way in which success is mediated in our current moment. So um, a key point here, right, uh, in this piece early on, um, Al Halberstam says, the concept of the weapons of the weak can be used to recategorize what looks like inaction, passivity, and lack of resistance in terms of the practice of stalling the business of the dominant. We can also recognize failure as a way of refusing to acquiesce to dominant logics of power and discipline and as a form of critique. As a practice, failure recognizes that alternatives are already embedded in the dominant and that power is never total or co consistent. Indeed, failure can exploit the unpredictability of ideology and its indeterminate qualities. Now here, Halberstam is revealing himself as someone who uh, is really invested in a more Foucauldian model of power. So we took a look at a section of uh, Michel Foucault's The History of Sexuality, where he talks about power being lateral and networked and fluid, right? And here we see Halberstam also kind of using that theory of power as a way that it can be reversed upon itself, that we, in, in refusing to do things, are also articulating a kind of, of power to say no. Um, moving forward, we could think of that no as a kind of art. And so Halberstam is really interested in art, not just the, as an aesthetic way of making culture, but also a way of making the self. And in that way, he's also very informed by Foucault. 
Um, so remember, to queer something, um, one of the definitions of queer is actually to spoil or ruin something, like an event, a situation, or an agreement. Uh, you may have heard a sort of old school expression like queering the deal, which means to um, ruin an agreement or plan. Um, so <laughs> Halberstam is like connected to this older definition of queer, which means to kind of ruin things for other people. <laughs> um, and this goes along with, remember Munoz's quote from Disidentifications, queers are those people who have failed to turn around to the hey you there interpolating call of heteronormativity, right? We talked about this quote earlier where you know, power says, hey, you, and queer people just kind of don't hear it or don't turn around. And in that moment, fail to be straight, fail to become straightened up. And uh, both Munoz and Halberstam are really interested in that moment of failure. So we could say that queer or trans people are those who fail, refuse, or forget to become or continue becoming straight or cisgender that we, we are not socially constructing ourselves along those processes, um, and that queer and trans praxis of unbecoming, refusal, forgetting, and denial of the value of straightness and cisness are critical wedges against the smooth surface of the culture's dominant ideology. So um, both Munoz and Hallerstam in different ways are interested a bit in kind of, once we fail to turn around, we reveal the kind of incompleteness of straightness and cisness to account for everything. And in that moment, other sorts of possibilities then become more perceivable. And kind of, they're both interested in staying in that space and seeing what's, what's there. So in other words, it's not just what queers want, which was Michael Warner's question, um, but what we also refuse or fail to want. And there's that sort of negative desire or negative utopia again that is important here. Like, why wouldn't anyone want to be straight, <laughs> right? Um, what is revealed in that refusal to want to be a straight or cis person? So how queers sustain and share this negative desire or lack of the right investments uh, is what Halberstam calls the queer art of failure, figuring out how to live within that space and use it to, to other purposes. So I have a couple of cool videos here. Halberstam actually um, has talked a lot about this theory of failure. I thought I'd start us off with uh, this one. So as I said, um, in the wake of, uh, you know, these riots that we're witnessing, these occupations, they're not new at all. Uh, there have been waves of um, mass protests spreading through Europe for basically the last five or six years. And in the wake of the French riots in the Banlieu that were uh, often North African immigrants were rising up against the, re the Republican uh, government in France, in the wake of that, people really started to think about these new forms of protest that now we are so much engaged in. And this is a, a beautiful piece of uh, graffiti saying the, the insurrection is coming and that then fed this little anarchist handbook, The Coming Insurrection. And I really do recommend that you read that. And I think of my book as, it's not exactly a manifesto, but it has manifesto pieces uh, in it. It's a manual, if you like, for failure. It's a how-to guide to failure in the age of global capitalism. It's a why to opt out of global capitalism and how to do so in ways that may not immediately be apparent, okay? So to that end, I like to give people um, little rules or little lessons in failure, sort of, you know, like the, the motivational speaker who has how to fail better, how to do a better job at failing. And the next slide, here we go, Samuel Beckett, the, the voice of modernist literature, probably the, the writer who has written in the most uh, full way about failure ever is Samuel Beckett. None of his characters succeeded anything ever. Okay, you only have to think of like, waiting for Godot, two clowns on the stage, they don't go anywhere, nobody arrives, nobody comes, nothing happens, no one learns anything, there is no moral lesson, there's no advance, right? He, that's, in fact, every single work he ever wrote is like that. Someone comes into the world, regrets it, does nothing, dies, okay? <laughs> That's modernism in a nutshell, but without the, the pomp and circumstance of a T.S. Eliot. So here you have it, no matter, try again, fail again, 
fail better, okay? So on, on, on behalf of this project of failing again and failing better, I have rules for you to follow accompanied um, by images. And the first rule, of course, is that you have to learn how to lose. And we live in a country that despises losers. In fact, we live in a state that despises losers. And Arnold Schwarzenegger's motto when he was governor of California was, I hate losers. He said, there are winners and losers, and I hate losers. And he, you have to re remember the Austrian sort of fascist accent that that comes out <laughs> in to really get the sinister quality there. Um, so in order to really embrace failure, to refuse success in the way that it's been offered to you by capitalism, we have to recognize that losing is part of life. It's part of everything that we do. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. And this is something that's it's easy to lose track of that in capitalism, in the version of capitalism that we've been living out, because capitalism has promised you that you will always win, right? No matter what the market's doing. Buy a house, it will, it will, it will you know, increase in value. Put money into the stock market, it will rise in value. Um, Buy a lottery ticket, you'll win. But remember that in order for there to be winners in capitalism, there have to be losers. And we know that the winners are now very few and that they are winning huge amounts and therefore everyone else is losing huge amounts. So learning to lose means actually being okay with losing and recognizing that winning is already such a compromise, such a corrupt project that we anyway should not be engaged in it. Okay, so that's kind of the thesis of Halberstam's book um, in a kind of um, simplified manner. And then this interview, uh, he goes into depth a bit more about why he chose to look at the kinds of texts he's looking at in this project. The reason I began writing about failure was I was invited to be part of a um, set of performances that were being curated by a, an art group. This was back in 2004, and the art group was called LTTR, and that can stand for any number of things, but at the time they were calling themselves Lesbians to the Rescue, and they curated an evening called Practice More Failure practice more failure. And this was in 2004, so it was uh, during the uh, Bush regime, and uh, all the emphasis in the US was on making money, uh, going to war, uh, being the world superpower. Uh, it was a very sort of nationalistic moment. There was also the Olympic Games was on, and the TV was full of American athletes winning all the time. So. At this event and in my presentation, I argued that failure was a, an anti-nationalist uh, discourse in an era of the superpower. My book is called The Queer Art of Failure, and it, uh, may, it, it focuses upon the way in which queer people uh, willingly and regularly almost choose to fail. Rather than succeed within the terms that the society has set up, i.e. reproductive futurity or um, being a productive person or making lots of money, uh, failure can uh, basically be a performance of dissent and refusal. And I based, I sketched out the way in which this was a queer category. In this, I shared with a lot of other theorists at the time who were writing about failure. Uh, the Probably the most important person writing about failure was Jose Munoz, who writes about queer failure in his book, Cruising Utopia. And he, in his archive, there are all of these artists who were in the scene around the time of Andy Warhol in New York, but were in relation to Warhol as failures. So Jack Smith, for example, was a very eccentric artist who would invite people over to his loft for a performance and then never show up. 
Um, he would create these sort of fantastical worlds, um, but he was always uh, on the very margins of even the art worlds that he was a part of. So um, there was a... I want, it's not an idealization or a romanticization of failure so much as a recognition that the term success and failure have a lot of political content and critique embedded within them. Someone like Lee Edelman uh, is in a way writing around some of the same issues, but he's a very strict psychoanalytic Lacanian critic. Uh, and therefore he would argue that homosexuality is a, is a position rather than a, an identity, a position in the, within the social structure that is set up to fail. And rather than uh, having a homosexual population who are desperately trying to get out of this category of failure and enter into the category of success, he argues for embracing failure, as do I. But for him, failure is structural rather than political. Um, and there isn't any particular politics that follows from this kind of negativity. Um, Leo Bassani, I think, is an, another interesting voice just because long before anyone else, he pointed to the fact that when we say the gay community, we're really creating a complete fiction of unanimity and uniformity and that there's nothing really that unites gay people. And furthermore, there's nothing necessarily that orients gay people to progressive or radical politics. And while there's a, something of a conservative bent to Bassani's work, at the same time, he allows for other people to do the work of saying why queer, what's radical about queerness, what's queer about radical politics, rather than presuming that gays and lesbians are, because of who they are, uh, uh, certain kinds of political subjects. So, you know, my work is very deliberately setting out to name a subject position, a political agenda, uh, and a form of critique that is uh, radically dissenting, grounded in refusal, and explicitly queer. We'll just wait for one more question. This is, why did you make a methodological choice on working with what you've called silly archives and animated feature films? One of my frustrations with a lot of academic theory is that it uses the same five philosoph philosophical traditions and philosophical currents over and over again. Um, and for me, that limits what can be said. Um, given that, y you know, in any given moment, there are so many people writing, and there are so many people writing amazing things. And given that we don't really any longer believe in canons of thought really strictly, it seemed to me that in a book on failure, you would want to push against the conventional and orthodox wisdom uh, around lineages of thought. So um, in my introduction, I craft something, uh, I, I argue on behalf of something called low theory. And low theory is opposed to high theory. And it takes as its archive uh, much of the popular culture texts that most avant-garde and queer writers will reject. So someone like Bassani, someone like Edelman, they're always going to go to Genet, Hitchcock, uh, um, I, I don't know, Gide. I mean, it's going to be always gay male writers, usually French, uh, who we can easily recognize within um, high modernist traditions. So my archive is deliberately an archive that seems not to have anything to say politically. However, the archive that I chose for this book was new animated feature films uh, for children. And this is because uh, one of the things that we do in, in um, capitalist cultures is we contain rebellion by casting it as childish. So we say, you know, certain forms of rebellion are just seen as being incredibly immature. And so children's films are loaded with these scenes of rebellion and uh, almost revolutionary impulse because it's seen as being a safe genre for the expression of revolutionary desire because it's directed to children. It casts revolutionary desire as any way immature, premature, uh, childish, and infantile. Um, and it, there's a kind of confidence that there is no political subject who will emerge from watching those films. So what I noticed in watching the Pixar movies, for example, is that they have 
um, oddly socialist themes to them. Um, they tend to involve groups of animals that rise up together against oppressive or exploitative masters. And one of the first Pixar films, A Bug's Life, just as an example, were a group of ants that whose food every winter was stolen by grasshoppers, who were fewer in number but bigger in size. And uh, so the ants decide that one day, that even though they're small, they're many and the many can overcome the few. So you, this is the beginning of, uh, uh, in Disney at any rate, in Pixar, uh, an emphasis on social insects and the many against the few. So instead of, in, in lots of uh, conventional films that are geared more towards adults, the emphasis is always on the individual, the individual love story, the individual tragedy, the individual within an adventure frame. But in children's films, the emphasis is always on the group. And this is also partly because children themselves are often in groups, they're not individuated in the same way. Um, and all of this adds up to this really crazy situation where you find incredibly radical stories being played out on the big screen for kids. And so I wanted to investigate that. And uh, the other thing that you have to do in a children's film is not focus too much on success because the lessons that parents want to teach their kids is it's okay to fa fail, try and try again, you know. Uh, and if everything was geared towards success, you'd end up with a lot of very neurotic children. So children's materials are archives of failure, awkwardness, clumsiness, um, failure, uh, um, the, the, and also a kind of strength and collectivity. So that theme sort of runs through the book, saying that in failure, you can access other forms of being in relationship to others uh, on behalf of a different political agenda. Okay, I'm gonna stop this here. That was a little bit long, but I do think it is, um, sorry, that's not the greatest uh, look on Halverson's face. Sorry, Jack. Um, <laughs> I'll just switch over to my notes. So uh, that video really does kind of encapsulate the reasons why theorists pick certain kinds of texts to um, find theory or apply theory within. And Halberstam is really plain spoken there about why he's gone to children's media as a place to really think about failure as a, as a sort of um, transformational space. So the style of failure, what is the style? Um, uh, I had you think a bit about this opening epigram from Quentin Crisp, uh, quote, if at first you don't succeed, failure may be your style. Um, his whole book is arranged around that idea. Um, and so what Halberstam is doing here, as he explained in that video, is really intervening in the definition of the antisocial thesis itself. Um, so he has three main points that he argues uh, in this piece about antisociality. He says, one, um, the archive of antisocial theory is too apolitical and too grounded in high art. So it's kind of, as we saw with The Living End, those guys were kind of, Luke and John were just kind of in it for themselves. They weren't building a collective politics of refusal. They were just refusing to be productive gay subjects, but it didn't lead to a, a different kind of political vision necessarily. So Halberstam says like, we need want to direct this toward a, an, an answer to capitalism in some way. Uh, two, he says that antisociality is too dominated by white gay, gay male perspectives, and we saw that very much with last week's content in some ways. Um, Love, of course, is not a white gay man, um, but the bulk of uh, antisocial theory is very much grounded in work by white gay men, and we see that very much in what Halberstam says. And then three, um, he says that it considers too few forms of antisociality. So he lists in this chapter forms of antisocial feeling really associated with white gay masculinity. Um, but then he also says there are all these other kinds of feelings associated with, say, lesbian uh, affect, butchness, right, anti-coloniality um, that don't make it into the archive. And he wants to challenge that. Um, he also argues that you could say queer antisociality is actually a lesbian style of failure linked specifically with butch masculinity and how butch masculinity points out the failure of cisgender straight masculinity to be uh, ideal or to be the only form of masculinity, right? That butches kind of problematize uh, masculinity being the purview of, of cis men 
and that that is why the butch lesbian is never really like admitted into textuality or into representation. Um, and so uh, Halberstam's interested in pursuing that idea. Um, Halberstam traces this style of failure through an archive of, of what he calls shadow feminisms. These are feminisms that are not happy or about being productive, right? They're often about bad feelings, destructiveness. Uh, uh, he, he talks about anti-coloniality and also kinds of lesbian cultural production that are interested in exploring the failure that many uh, queer and trans people experience in their lives. Um, and he just also in that video explains that he develops this idea of low theory that allows him to look at mass culture and unlikely spaces where we wouldn't expect uh, sort of radical queer politics to be located. Um, in this book, he looks specifically at Chicken Run, The Fantastic Mr. Fox, Finding Nemo, A Bug's Life, Shrek, Babe, Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., and SpongeBob SquarePants as texts that are, he says, um, queer in this low way rather than like high art um, as a queer archive. Uh, just a few more things. So uh, key quotes here. Uh, Halberstam says, quote, if we want to make the antisocial turn in queer theory, we must be willing to turn away from the comfort zone of polite exchange in order to ex embrace a truly political negativity. Um, one that promises this time to fail, to make a mess, to fuck shit up, to be loud, unruly, impolite, to breed resentment, to bash back, to speak up and out, to disrupt, assassinate, shock, and annihilate, unquote. And I think this definitely puts Halberstam in, in line with Queers Read This, uh, which we just looked at last week, right? Where also there are people saying, if we really, we really need to harness this negative affect that we're experiencing and develop a politics around it. Uh, rather than looking to be loved because we're in, we're victims, right? Uh, they kind of say straight people will never love you, um, and so never love you unconditionally, and so we need to fuck shit up. Um, Halberstam follows this by writing about um, the archive, right, and and some of the ways he's arranging his archive. The archive is just the the number the kind of body of texts cultural text that he's drawn together in this in this book and why he's putting them next to each other. Uh, he writes of that opening quote for Crisp, as for an artist such as Andy Warhol, failure presents an opportunity rather than a dead end. In true camp fashion, the queer artist works with rather than against failure and inhabits the darkness. Indeed, the darkness becomes a crucial part of a queer aesthetic. Uh, darkness, Brooks continues, is an interpretive strategy and a mode of reading the world from a particular and dark position. It is this understanding of textual darkness or the darkness of a particular reading practice from a particular subject position that I believe resonates with the queer aesthetics I trace here as a catalog of resistance through failure. And so this, uh, he talks about the darkness of like um, certain kinds of uh, photographs of queer life, uh, pre-Stonewall, um, pre-identitarian queer life. Um, and we could think of this darkness as also this lowness, right? This closeness to the ground, this lack of light um, in the archive. And then uh, he cites love, right? Remember, we just finished with love last week. He writes, uh, as love puts it, quote, backward feelings serve as an index to the ruined state of the social world. They indicate continuities between the bad gay past and the present, and they show up in the inadequacies of the queer narratives of progress. Unquote. To feel backward is to be able to recognize something in these darker depictions of queer life without needing to redeem them. And uh, I think that's really crucial, that it's not just that we go looking for these instances of failures and hold them up and say they're actually secret modes of success. Like, Halberstam is cautioning us to not try to turn failure into a new way of succeeding, but rather to... Um, look at these instances of queer failure without needing to redeem them, without needing to bring them back into the discourse of capitalist productivity um, or turn them into alternative methods for success or DIY success models, right? He's saying just let them be dark um, and let the darkness inside you also be dark because darkness is where unexpected transformation can really lie. Um, and lastly, uh, he talks about his archive of heroes here, like uh, antisocial heroes, Renton, Johnny Rotten, Ginger, Dorian, Babe, 
like those athletes who finish fourth, remind us that there is something powerful in being wrong, in losing, in failing, and that all our failures combined might just be enough if we practice them well to bring down the winner. Let's leave success and its achievement to the Republicans, to the corporate managers of the world, to the winners of reality TV shows, to married couples, and to SUV drivers. Um, the concept of practicing failure perhaps prompts us to discover our inner dweeb, to be underachievers, to fall short, to get distracted, to take a detour, to find a limit, to lose our way, to forget, to avoid mastery, and with Walter Benjamin, to recognize that, quote, empathy with the victor invariable, invariably benefits the rulers, unquote. All losers are the heirs of those who lost before them. Failure loves company. And that's his final sentence. Um, so, <laughs> uh, for Thursday, I'm going to ask you to check out Finding Nemo, and I think a key uh, line from that movie that we can all keep practicing to ourselves right now is just keep swimming. It doesn't matter where we're headed. We don't need to be goal-oriented. We just need to be in the here and now, and we just need to keep swimming, doing what we're doing. It will become a logic of its own. It will lead uh, to transformation of some kind. Change will happen. Um, so if everything feels stuck now, just keep swimming. Um, and I'll have you travel back over to the discussions tab to add some thoughts in response to this lecture. So uh, that's it for today. And I hope you're all uh, okay and staying safe. And uh, I'll look in the discussions tab for your responses. All right, bye.